Call to order the Monday, January 22nd meeting of the Parent Community Outreach Subcommittee. We will start with um, Salute to the Flag. Oh, no, Deb, oh, please call the roll. Mr. Bailey? Here. Mr. Corey? Here. Mr. Rodgers? Also here. Now we'll Salute to the Flag. Yes. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag of the United, United States, States of America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived by those present and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. Is there any citizens' input? There is not. Okay, so we will dive right in. I just want to make a point that there's nothing on this agenda that's you know, outright intense or uh, we're really just looking to check in because we know that we have some really good initiatives and it's important that people know the work that's happening in the community. So we'll jump right in. We can talk about item 3.1, the Parent Academy. Awesome. Um, so on behalf of the district SEL team, I think it's only, uh, you know, right that I introduce Cindy Kudo, um, who is the director of our Parent and Community Engagement Center. Um, I have been working very close with Cindy this year um, as we've really looked to put some uh, systems in place and supports in place with consistency across all of our schools as we um, are building out some really amazing community partnerships and predictable uh, programs for families as we start to set up some systems and routines, hopefully that families can begin to predictably anticipate um, with some regularity behind the work. And Parent Academy has certainly been um, one of our biggest successes. And I would say, I think everything has had a really lot of great success across its own right. Um, but Parent Academy has launched in October. Um, and since October, we've had an event every single month and our participation of families continues to grow every month. Um, so I want to kick it to Cindy to speak to a little bit about what we've had going on with Parent Academy. Yeah, so we've, um, I think what's, you know, really made a difference is inviting families on a personal level. So we've developed a protocol uh, with our community facilitators. So it's on, um, we kind of have a schedule. When the flyers come out, we talk about what's happening at the workshop, present it in our community facilitator meetings, and not only is it being sent out through Parent Square, but we're also identifying families that would benefit from whatever we're presenting and personally inviting those families. Uh, we're, we're also providing uh, child care and food, so that, that's helping bring in more and more families. Um, so we're pretty very excited about that and we actually have families now um, you know reaching out asking more details about events um, we have about a hundred families that have confirmed for this week's parent workshop so we're super excited for that we also leverage the translation software headsets yes. that helps add one more layer of translation for our families and that was a real huge hit at one of our events that was more widely populated across a network of language capacities. Um, so it really helped us also personalize the workshops for those families and created cool little communities of like languages within the event so that families could build their own community and really be able to, to communicate not just about the event but also just about being a Fall River, right, and you know, grow, raising kids in the city, and it was really cool to just see those relationships begin to establish themselves. Um, and we have been noticing some repeat customers at our Parent Academy events, um, so it's been nice too for us to foster those relationships with families, because we're seeing them now on a monthly basis in a unstructured but structured sort of time where we can be social and be human too with them, which is really cool. Um, so every month, it's the last Thursday of the month, uh, we've been leveraging community partners to be the facilitators of those workshops. Um, this month particularly, the topic is... So um, it's geared towards our MLL family, so we have three presenters coming in, um, and it's about um, just services for our families who are... So we have Source Hub coming in to just talk about what they can offer to families the Office of the Attorney General to talk about immigration, uh, tenant landlord rights, uh, workers rights, um, and then we have the Mass Immigration and Refugee Coalition coming in as well 
talking about um, tuition free and tuition equity law for um, some of our undocumented students. In our biggest, biggest parent academy event, drum roll please, uh, we really are pumped. We are offering parent ESL classes. Um, so we've launched that um, program literally two weeks ago and within I, I'm literally, within 72 hours, we had the rosters completely full. Yeah. So we're offering two classes, 35 people per class, um, with, by the end of the second day, and we families had to come in to register in person because we wanted to really um, lay out what was the expectation, and they had to fill out forms um, to register for the event. So by the second day, we were already filled to capacity, for 70 students. Um, and now today we just uh, got the final total up until today we're up to 200 um, students or families individuals actually individuals, yeah. um, so 70 will start this um, in April um, no February to April and then we're going to um, add on two more classes in April so uh, we'll be able to um, hopefully service all these families okay. yeah and more um, yeah, and we're going to provide child care as well for these, so it's twice a week. Um, and we're partnering with our students at the high school, and they're going to earn community service hours um, to help care for okay. in child care. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. Yeah. So that's Parent Academy and a little bit of um, a summary. Do we have questions? Or? I have one question. Cindy, as far as it, the kids at school taking care of the kids and child care, <coughs> are there any liability issues that go along with that? So we're going to have staff there too. They won't be taking care of them by themselves. So it'll be, you know, my staff as well there. Yeah. Um, and, but they'll be able to help. So we've done that throughout our parent academy. So they'll come in, play basketball with kids. Um, but it's never just the students alone. Um, staff, it's always staff. So if a child gets hurt in any kind of way? It would just be, you know, just like any other school event. Okay. So the oversight and the, mm -hmm. the liability yes. lies with we, Yes, we have staff that would be. Thank you. Anything else? This, didn't we have a family academy years ago? Yes. Okay, so Saturdays used to be on Saturday mornings. Yeah, yep. okay. So I was seeing the Parent Academy and then just kind of looking at that, thinking we had this something similar mm -hmm. in the past, and yep. I don't know where that went, but I'm glad to see that that's revisited because yeah. the more opportunities families get to engage, the better. Mm -hmm. And I, I do think we had something similar in the past because on the outside of PACE, it actually says Parent Academy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I said to myself, when I was walking in with mm -hmm. Cindy back in September, I'm like, well, Parent Academy on the sign, we might as well stick with the name, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Because if it's got recognition, mm -hmm. we can kind of jumpstart that recognition again. Yeah, yeah. can I have an, another course. question? So along, along the lines of the Parent Academy, mm -hmm. so when you guys meet, um, what about around report card time or progress report time? Is that a time for parents to come together too at the same time to ch check and monitor their child's progress? Schools do that. At, at the schools they do. Um, they partner with parents and have parent-teacher conferences. Sometimes they do, in addition to that, they have some sort of um, educational learning mm -hmm. um, thing going on, partnering, but they've had, a lot of schools have done um, invited partners in on the night that they have parent-teacher conferences. So um, yes, schools will partner with parents for a report card. Yeah, that way the, the parents are staying on top mm -hmm. of the situation. Yep. So, thanks. So to just piggyback on that, could could there be an opportunity, because report cards look different now than they did years ago, right? especially for our, our elementary school kids. Is there an opportunity to do sort of a parent academy event where you go over at the beginning of the year, this is what report cards are gonna look like, this is what progress reports are gonna look like, this is how you understand them, this is how you read them, this is what a two in yes. this area mm -hmm. means versus you know a, a one or a three in this area. So we've talked about that um, in, in, in what we had decided on was creating mini workshops. So it's school specific because okay. school, you know, elementary, middle, it all mm -hmm. looks different. So we talked about that. In addition to having the mini workshops, 
we're going to uh, partner with our Fred TV so that we also have video links. Mm -hmm. So families that weren't able to make it that night or mm -hmm. needed a refresher to go back, we're going to create a library of all these mini awesome. workshops. Um, you know, and then we had also talked about like um, PSAs mm -hmm. around, did you know? how to read your kid's report card, right? And then like yeah. walk someone through when the template comes home, these are the items you wanna look at, this is what it means, and um, this is how you can reach out for support at your school. But like quick little vignettes mm -hmm. that kind of get right to the point, quick little did you knows, and then have larger coaching sessions and larger opportunities for families to come together um, for bigger discussions. Um, but yes, you know, partnering with schools, if you notice, you know, and we'll get to that actually in the discussion of community partnerships, but we have really, begun to develop and overdevelop our parent-teacher conferences so that they're not just standalone, come and get your kids report card mm -hmm. events, but really taking advantage of um, bringing families into the buildings yeah. and really turning our buildings into showcases that can offer families more than just report cards, right? right. Yes. yes, we want report cards and that has yes. to be the main agent, yes. right? Talking, teaching and learning and student outcomes is really important. But, oh, while you're coming to school, how about connecting with a plethora of community partners um, who can bring to the table a wide range of varied Absolutely. resources, yeah. right? And as we look at parent Family teacher services, CD rec, and so, the like. So right? that is one thing that we have been doing some real deep work with right from the beginning of September this year, is working with the Let's Talk Tuesday group. Um, which is contingent upon you know the United Way extension with Wendy Garflip and United Neighbors and that huge community network that we are, they're all connected to and through, um, and we've been fortunate to be able to put out recruitment um, solicitations to our community partners saying hey come join us come join and be part yeah. of it. So Good. they have then what we've done as a school department is produce our dates for parent-teacher conferences, they've selected themselves in, so we can then have a wide range of, of access. We're offering this, mostly all schools have signed up to open the doors, and we're really looking at like the first, the parent-teacher conferences happen two times mm -hmm. a year, mm -hmm. um, and so depending upon the school and when that happens, a combination of open house and parent-teacher conferences so that two times a year, minimally, we can get to our we can get to the place that every school will host a resource fair on grounds connected to either open house or parent teacher conferences that are already contractually built in for everybody um, that will then generate our opportunity to say at least two times a year every school is getting a robust resource fair um, built into something we're already trying to attract families to um, so I know speaking firsthand that's really what generated a high yield outcome to parent teacher conferences not saying it's directly related, but if I can show up, get some access to some resources, maybe have a bite to eat, um, and, a, a and then a different going, activity yeah, going on for the kids, schools, um, yeah. it really just helped generate really strong parent-teacher co conference outcomes and just help support the climate and culture and relationship building yeah. across schools, you know? Um, so we are really excited just about that sort of cohesive come together um, and report cards have been central to leveraging that conference conference I like time. It. I like it. Yep. That's good. And I'll just piggyback on that as a parent. So I go to my daughter's parent teacher conference and they co they had it coincide with the holiday shop that was going on. So they had teachers um, they had paras supporting kids being able to go and shop for their family members while maybe one parent is in or one family member is in a conference. You have the kids that are doing something. There's access to resources like the library was there. Um, and they were signing kids up for library cards, which then they were coming in and doing a pop-up library, like a, the bookmobile was coming. They're so excited about that. So just having that vast array of sort of stuff to engage while yeah. the parents were coming in made such a difference. Gives people a reason to go mm -hmm. out, you know. Because just a 10 minute conference. Right, yeah. rather than just the five, 10 minute conference, because let's be honest, that's difficult to do mm -hmm. when you know it's 20 degrees outside and it's important, but it can be a challenge. But mm -hmm. if you have other stuff that's sort of dragging you in, then it's Great. always a positive. Cool, anything else on Parent Academy? All right, so we'll go to 3.2 Community Partnerships. So for community partnerships, you know, emphasizing the work that we're doing right now um, across so many of our community partners, um, I did just speak about the parent uh, teacher conferences and the community resource fairs. Um, I know it's end of January, but not all that long ago. We were in November and we had our FRPS holiday fundraiser. Um, this was our biggest event 
yet, I think, yeah. as far as even just staff and, and seeing people come out. So we were really excited about that. Um, so Cindy and Claudia led that work. So if they could speak to um, our we outcomes. Had about 300 participants um, in person and raised the most ever. So we were, uh, we raised a little over 20,000, which 20,000 has been our goal for the last couple of years. So super excited about that. And that all directly uh, benefits our students, 100% of the proceeds. So uh, we were able to um, assist families in you know, taking care of students for the holiday season. It's twofold. It also is a community building mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, yes. for staff. It was nice to see people yeah. get involved. I've seen some pictures. Mm -hmm. People were yeah. excited. Yeah. Um, in addition to that, as I'm sure the community saw us out um, in full force during the Photo Children's Holiday Parade, um, our schools were very much well represented, staffs, you know, students, families alike, always a great time to kick off the holiday season within the community, and we love being a part of it. Um, in addition to that, our community facilitators, we really felt this was a great opportunity to um, bring up the impact that our growing and developing network of community facilitators are having within our buildings. Um, we're really seeing some of this monthly engagement and our approach to creating a parent engagement protocol um, so that we, you know, we have a lot of staff around buildings that are doing really deep work with families, getting to know families, getting to learn about families, understand the ebbs and flows of the challenges and ebbs and flows of the successes um, that are going on across our school communities. But being able to have community facilitators then follow through, connect up around all of the different events that are going on across whether it's the district level or the school-based level, right? Because keep in mind, schools are running their own incentives, their own ongoing activities and sports and you know theater programs and music and, and extracurriculars. Um, but then there's also the district initiatives that our community facilitators are very marvelously navigating between the balancing act of supporting both the district level initiatives to make sure that things are going out with consistency, where marketing programs and, and our SEL days, um, our parent academy events, just really trying to make sure that things have a through line to them and they're not getting stuck at the point of communication um, simply because it just gets buried in someone's inbox mistakenly, right? Um, so our community facilitators have really just been instrumental. I will tell you, you know, we meet once a month as a community at PACE. It is certainly one of my meetings that I've grown to really look forward to. Who's, who's a community facilitator? Can you describe that? With? So the community facilitators, we have pretty much one assigned to every building. Right. Yes. Right. We added that to the budget last oh, year. Oh, so so it's before. our staff. It's, yes, it's our staff. It's our staff acting as a facilitator toward all these initiatives. Correct. Well, the, the link on. between home and school yeah. partnerships. Yep. 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 Um, many of our communities facilitators speak multiple languages and are you know dual dual language, trilingual, so trilingual that's, that's even. Good. That's good. Um, so their ability to really be able to immediately connect with families um, is important. They're also, you know, there in the front office and many times they kind of work out of that front office area in many places. So they are centrally connected to and aware of a lot of what's going on across schools being in that main hub of the main office, you know, okay. knowing families coming and going. They um, support each other at like parents yes. teacher conferences. Yeah. So, you know, they'll, they'll take turns going to each other's schools to help uh, tra with translation services. So building that capacity. Yep. Um, internally, they're working very directly with PACE. Um, so a lot of the initiatives, you know, we kind of get jump started at pace and then things roll out to the buildings. Um, and it feels like we're in a great place of the system development um, and just having the people between having the people at pace and the right people and building a strong team that we know we can then count on in buildings um, to move the initiatives forward um, in support of the work has really just been instrumental. Um, and not to mention, they're a great group. Um, they make you laugh, and I, honestly, they just make me laugh um, because their energies are high. They're always looking for the next way to be as effective as we can. And they get a little competitive, right? Like, they want those competitive outcomes. They want to know how many people showed up. They want to know, you know, what families did it so they can call them back, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it's a really cool developing position um, that we're really excited. We've gotten some good structures and systems behind in the first half of the school year. So, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so, what you're doing, so, so what you're doing is you're breaking down barriers of mm -hmm. communication between schools and families 
and you're using the community resources around us. All right, so I'm going to ask, I, I think this could be a relatable question, and in no means is this question pointed at just the Fall River Public Schools, but it seems to be one of the social phenomena, post-COVID reaction, our children's lack of attention in the classroom. How can these initiatives help our children to behave in a more consistent manner? Well, we're going to get there. We haven't gotten to that part. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, is that one of maybe the objectives? One of our initiatives that we're going to get to in a few minutes. Yep, on the SEL okay. initiatives and family connections piece, we'll definitely oh, touch okay. upon that. Okay, in you'll the touch next. Yep. That's great. Okay. Yep. Can I, can I that's not it? unique to Fall River. No. no. That's, yeah, 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 everywhere. I, yeah, it's, like, every, it's everywhere. Literally. Yeah. Yeah. At all yeah. levels. Yeah. yeah. Can I throw my two cents in about that, though? Yeah, of course. So, because yeah, this is like... You're the chair. You can do it. No, but this not this. But this is where I live, right? But when we talk about community facilitators and how that translates to what's happening in the classroom, I think there's a big translation to what's happening in the classroom. Because if you can get families, and I say families instead of parents because it's not always a parent, right, that's, that's right. with a kid. Um, but if you get a, a family that's more engaged in their child's school, right, then by, by sort of default, you have a child that is seeing that modeling happening, right? You're witnessing that parent being able, or that adult be able to interact with other people at the school. You're seeing them be able to yeah. go through all those. So I think that community facilitator role is huge <clears throat> in being able to eventually get, yeah. it's not the only piece. Yeah, so it's helping to build, huge. trust. It's helping to build more capacity and trust. in that way. Mm -hmm. I get you. And what you were saying about like our kids are really struggling to just pay attention and engage and yeah. sit in a seat, right, and be able to do all of those things. There's a huge developmental lag right now because of COVID, and it's not just with the kids. Yeah, which mm -hmm. I prefaced my comment by, oh, by, by, this is not a Fall River problem. No. Yeah. It's a social, it's a societal yeah, it problem. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I just want to know how we can deal with it in our schools. I get so excited talking about this, so that's where I'm like, my hands are everywhere and I'm jumping out of my seat because yeah. I get excited talking Thank about you. it. Thank you, thank you. Absolutely. I would just say, you know, when we look at the community partnerships piece, the other thing, um, the United Way right now, just to put a plug, is doing the Warm Coat campaign. Um, and so Fall River Public Schools is supporting the United Way um, as we are op we've opened up Pace and we are opening up here at Rock Street. Um, so should anybody hearing, you know, this, this meeting today or catch wind, um, let's support the United Way in their coat campaign. You can drop off any lightly used coats. Please just make sure you empty the pockets and they're good to go. Um, here at Pace, uh, or at Pace, I should say, or here at 417 Rock, um, because giving back to our community partners whenever we have the opportunity to do so and being part of the greater good, uh, we certainly want to showcase our support too. So uh, we are, you know, kind of co-partnering at the same time. Whenever we have a chance that we can promote and support those the agencies, we want to give that opportunity too. Any other pieces on that community calendar? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, perfect. Sorry, my God, I, did I, I missed that. Sorry. Um, so we are really excited. It's on the back, that's why. Um, we also are just launching in its infancy stages right now. Um, so we are, there was a need with, across the community for a host of a community calendar. Mm -hmm. um, I happened to attend um, a community event back in October, and I realized that our bullying event um, before the Parent Academy, as I was trying to market it and be excited about it, there was a very, very interesting event that was happening at Atlantis Charter at the time. Um, and I was like, oh, I would have never put this event on this day if I, if I would have realized this other event was going on for families and it was open access, right? And so when we think about the many, many events that are going on across the community, you know, Fall River Public Schools that can and has the opportunity to be a central, play a central role in that work of hosting a community calendar so that all of the nonprofits and all of the organizations across the community who are serving the same Fall River population to the best of our ability, we can don't have to necessarily plan in competition with each other. That's good. And so by leveraging this community calendar, um, we've identified a system. Uh, we, we created an email with the tech support from the Fall River Public Schools. Uh, we have two uh, support staff down at Pace who are going to be the keepers of the calendar. We have shared the calendar information with our community partners, saying essentially, start emailing, attach the PDFs, and we're gonna man the calendar. Um, so if you're hearing and you are a community partner who services our community in a non-for-profit approach, 
Uh, we are here to market your events as long as they serve our kids. Um, and we want to be able to market everybody's events so that, number one, we have a place to use as a guide so we're not competing with anyone. And at the same time, we want to be able to recommend to our families where they can go to find resources should they be in need across the ebb and flow of time that we work with families, right? What some families need in the fall might be different than what families need in the winter and vice versa of what families might need in the spring and summer months. Um, so by hosting a one-stop shop calendar, our goal will be to celebrate all of our efforts and build a united Fall River. Um, so our com calendar is um, it's the com it's, it's in its, its infancy it's stages, it's, but it's it's up there already. We trained our staff today, so we're pretty much ready to go. Um, we are working on the look of it and what that the final look will be. Um, but it's there already, so and it's going to live on the homepage of the Fall River Public Schools. So it'll be an automatic draw for families. Uh, families who are partaking with Parent Square will also be able to know like what's an event for my school versus an event within the community. We're going to color code it for families as well. Um, so we're really thinking outside the box on all the ways that we want it to be like one click and go type of it, type way for families. I think I think I think this is huge. Um, I've been talking about this for some time. One of my biggest things is just I think we have to really overly promote this. Um, Especially with the with the community partners in um, former schools, just because my only not concern, but my only thing would be um, just making sure parents, uh, families have the, the information. All right, um, I think it's going to take some time to actually really get it going. Yeah. But I think this is amazing. Um, but like I said, social media, however we can share it, um, and community partners just so we're all on the same page. But. I think this is a huge one, and I think we can do some, some cool stuff. Um, shout out to Deb Sardina, who's not here with us. I just want to give a plug to Deb. Social media is what kind of jogged my brain right there. Um, Deb has been really instrumental with helping us see the tech wave through um, in partnership with our tech department, but also helping us see it from a social media perspective and making sure that things are pleasantly visible to the screen capacity, right? Um, so we have begun to take all of these pieces into account. It literally launched two weeks ago in January. Oh, like last week, I think it was last week. Last, yeah, last week, was at a meeting. yeah, I heard about it. Yeah. So I feel like that La yeah, was it was last actually week. last week. Yeah. So it is literally like just out the gate. Yeah. Um, but the next great. phase will be a marketing campaign to get it out there. Deb did a really great job with creating a flashy little flyer. So our goal is to like get it out there from a visual perspective too, yeah. so people know what they're looking for. Um, and once we get it exactly how we want it on the website, we'll take pictures of that and then really start promoting so people know physically what they're looking for on the website. I, I almost think of it like even doing some type of contest. I know we do a few contests just to make it um, contest-based, I guess, just because I, I feel like you're still gonna have people who don't know about the calendar. Um, I think of like the MLK contest that we do. I mean, it goes citywide, everyone knows what's going on. I think just like I said, I think it can be huge, um, and I definitely think it's something we need it for some time now. So, great job. Awesome. Good. Yeah. So that's all very exciting. So as far as promotional stuff is concerned, um, I got excited when I heard the idea of PSAs moving. You know, to plug plug the positives that are going on inside the Fall River Schools. And in my one discussion with Maria recently. Uh, is there any free time on SAR to get PSAs going or do they charge for all of their advertising time? I look into that. <laughs> oh God, because I'm just wondering if, there's, usually... a com if there's a community component and then because SAR's listenership is like 400,000, it's regional. So that's just another great way of getting all of this good news out there. Beside uh, Fred TV and FR FRC Media. FRC Media, Fred TV, WSAR, and um, I think um, uh, the other news outlet. I forget. I forget who they are right now. The other news outlet. But um, SAR especially. And, and if there's anything that you think I can do to that end, just you know, inform me. So I, I, I will say that we do have a weekly radio show. Which is great. Which we promote. Um, so this should get plugged every week that you're on the radio our, show. Um, yeah, the community um, calendar moving forward. Absolutely. So yes. I was thinking too with the community calendar as you were talking, 
could we mention the events that are happening? So if you're doing a weekly show, like, oh, and don't forget, we have this event. You can find all of this information oh, on the community. Our community yeah, we can totally come up with yeah. a script that you can use yeah. every single week. That's right. Let's give it to one of the kids. Yeah. Even, even a little jingle to yeah, that's what I'm saying. Absolutely. A little yeah, jingle to, my guests as a week. notification of the community <laughs> calendar. I make a motion to nominate Tom to create a jingle. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have zero yeah. musical ability. Yeah. <laughs> no, it just, it just raises attention to yeah. the yeah. issue. Yeah. No, I love that you said that because we can totally create a reoccurring statement that Maria reads Absolutely. on every session. And then what ends up happening by default, even if you don't know this, but I do know this from six years of my Sunday call, people begin to wait for that yeah. segment of your call. Maybe not wait for, but if people are really waiting to oh, hear about what's coming up, they're going to know where that lives in your script mm -hmm. yeah. and they'll log in to hear like what's coming up especially if it's someone who maybe is not as technologically inclined to log on for themselves so that's a great idea and if we will just create mm -hmm. that and then we can print them right off the website and then maria can promote the citywide events not just the formal public schools events at that point but part of our community lodger we know it's community. Like right after the jingle and i mean that seriously like we know the jingle happens <coughs> and then you know, we make the announcement yeah. and then the last segment. You're getting the last segment. Yeah. from people yeah. to segment. There. Yeah, the, jing people. the jingle it's would serve as a notification yeah. for those announcements. Yeah. 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 yeah, absolutely. Yep. Right by the last segment. We know exactly where we're going Perfect. Mm -hmm. Perfect. <coughs> and then on top of that, we will get a promotion promotion campaign kind of going. Mm -hmm. And what are the actionable steps of getting the calendar promoted? Um, but we didn't want to miss the opportunity to share it here. So. So I know this got brought up at a community meeting that we had attended way back, mm -hmm. um, and there was a, a question about where a community calendar could live. This is what, like a year and a half ago, two yes, years ago at this was, point? Um, and then one of the before, questions, yeah. or one of the comments that came up is that uh, Fall River does have a community mm -hmm. calendar right through Viva Fall River. Yeah. Um, I, I think, and my opinion is, doesn't really make much of a difference here, but I, I think it's important that we have a school community calendar, right? That it's right there and visible because not every family is going to access that. But if we have some partnership with them to make sure that we have whatever events they have on their calendar comes on our calendar, it becomes another way of making sure that all of this is tied in. As so we had ta I had briefly talked with Patty. Um, I think one of the things that we just want to be really careful about is that we are not promoting individual private efforts. Right. So um, one of the things that I had, you know, again, we're not at the point yet in the process of this piece, mm -hmm. um, but had briefly talked with Patty Rigo from Viva Fall River around how do we link your link so that if people want to go find events from Viva yes. Fall River, it can all live in one place. Um, but the way that we were going to vet what gets posted on this, if you would, or kind of sift through would be if you are a partner within the organization. And then anybody who is not part of the organization, we would send to Kim Smith and Wendy to kind of let us know if this lives within the guidelines of what our organization yeah. is and get the green light from, from them as the coordinators of the Let's Talk and certainly mm -hmm. the you know main philanthropy philanthropy perfy folks. Sorry that like <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Good and fair. We all have some of those. Thank things. you. Yep. <laughs> my brain was going faster than my mouth. Um, but just to make sure that we're not getting duped by anybody, mm -hmm. trying to be somebody they're not. We don't want any of that shenanigans going on. Yeah. Just trying to promote and have everything live where it can live and there's a place that everything can be promoted. Yeah, my thought was more of um, kind of cross checking, like, oh, you have this not you have child and families event on your calendar. We don't have it on on our calendar, so let let's make sure that we're reaching out to them so we get their their yes. stuff and vice versa. Mm -hmm. That's more yes. of what I was thinking, and that's um, what happened two years ago. There yeah, some events that were. Called that's more Flashing. of what I yeah. was thinking. Like, oh, so we're thinking both, here. right? Yes, we want to make sure we're not missing people. To Bobby's point, like some folks might not mm -hmm. even recognize the calendar's up and running, so we want to yeah. do access. But we also want to make sure we're staying true to not marketing private yeah. um, business and, and whatnot. So um, we're just going to live in the balance of that as we mm -hmm. figure it out in the first you know, six months or so um, and lean into our partners within the community to help us sort of navigate that pathway. Okay. Um, and then we are moving to 3.3, SEL initiatives and family connections. I know you have a lot of good work happening there. Um, so we do have a lot of good work happening across all of these buckets. Um, our SEL initiatives uh, really right now is, is getting at the, the roots of providing some curriculum materials in the world of SEL and really exposing our staff to some resources and tools. 
um, so that they can dig in particularly to make sure that we are meeting the identified needs of kids but also meeting the unidentified or not outwardly expressed needs of kids. Um, <coughs> Claudia has been instrumental uh, working in partnership directly with me all year long as we've been bringing forth a number of different curriculum and universal screener tools. Um, looking first at the universal screeners and resources, we gave back in November professional development, we had a whole day aligned to giving our student support staff across the district, exposing them to the four different um, SEL screeners and the aligning tools and SEL lessons that help support the development of our kids across the five SEL competencies and the sub competencies within those competencies. We have never used a universal screener across the district, so this has been our first go round. Right now, we are in the process right now of piloting um, two screeners, particularly after we went through this investigation process, schools identified the screeners they were most interested in. They leaned heavily into two, really into one screener because of the number of languages being kid friendly, developmental, um, to meet the needs of our kids from a K through 12 perspective. But then in addition to that, the toolbox was extensive. Um, so when we think about putting kids and supporting kids in a small group setting, what is then the curriculum that we're going to use to support those kiddos and what social competency are we developing as a result of that? So really digging deep with our counselors um, to pilot these materials. We've got some schools piloting them K to five. We have a school piloting K to five. Uh, we do have a middle school pilot. We have a high school pilot. All of our special populations right now are seen within the pilot, which was really important to us. Um, so our students with disabilities in substantially separate classrooms all across the scope of supports and, and services that we provide, as well as our multilingual learners across all of the language needs of our students and language development needs of our students, the programs uh, were able to attend to those needs. So we just finished the screener with one of them last week. Uh, February 9th PD will expose our staff to the next phase of the program and then buildings will begin using those programs over the course of the next six to eight weeks so that we can make some recommendations to the committee as we come to the end of the year after we have explored, experienced, and then made some recommendations after those pieces of it. In addition to that, we've really tried to be uh, responsive to school needs and school requests. The high school was looking to look at a different uh, SEL screener for different reasons with a little more independence built into the program, which is what they were feeling was gonna meet the needs of the kids that they were looking to serve most immediately. So they are also right now in the place of piloting that particular screener. Um, so we've got a few different things going on across the district, but schools are heavily engaged in that work. Um, Claudia, is there anything in addition to that around the screener piece particularly? No, I think it's more to come. I mean, yeah. we just closed the pilot with one of them, and then um, the high school is going to be trained on the PD day for their screener as well, too. So we're just going to be we're going to be all exposed to it in the next couple yes, of weeks. Yes, we will for certain, for certain. So we are excited about that, um, and that's for the screener tools and those curriculum tools. As we look at SEL curriculum, um, we do not have currently an SEL curriculum across the district. I say that lightly, we have used Choose Love in the past. Some schools are still using Choose Love, um, but it is not a widespread use across all of, our, all of our schools. We had received some initial informal feedback over the last few years that, you know, especially post pandemic, um, Choose Love wasn't giving us the tools and resources that we needed to really be able to meet the needs of the kids in front of us. Um, this year, um, just most recently in the last couple of weeks, we have hosted a presentation from two different curriculum platforms. We've got schools that are interested in further exploring these particular curriculums. And again, we are looking to pilot some of that, that work in schools that are not using the screener. So we are not double dipping on schools and adding too much that schools can't handle, um, but really trying to get a landscape of exposure on some of our programs so that we can make some educated decisions when we come to the spring to make recommendations to the committee. Um, so those... It's that second step and... Mm -hmm. It is. Second step before, right? Yes. Second step and positive action were the two um, programs that we looked at and With were... With second step before Choose Love. Oh, yeah. yeah. For yeah. years and years. Mm -hmm. But I know that there's an updated version, but we've been using step, 
at least 15. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So as far as uh, my question was going to be in regard to second step, uh, I actually ran the program. Um, um, Meg Mayo Brown asked me to uh, to run that program, and it was extremely successful. I had an opportunity to visit every school in the district and oversee their second step sessions from kindergarten through fifth grade, and um, it built. It built relationship, it built temperance, it, it made kids listen because the technique in second step is to hold, whoever's holding the object is the person who's talking and everybody else has to listen and then once the child is done talking then others that want to talk and weigh in and help the issue have to hold the object. So it's always just one child speaking at a time. And uh, it really worked out well. The reason why that got nullified was uh, the state had passed the bullying legislation. And the bullying legislation uh, <coughs> superseded all the second step programming. And we had a lot of material that I actually had to uh, regroup and send back to, to uh, Seattle. Um, so that we could reclaim some of the monies spent in the program. But what I'm speaking to is my real experience in the second step program, and that was extremely effective. I hope that it's one of the techniques that we're using with some of the early kids. Yes, it's one of the programs that we are exploring to pilot. Does second steps have the anti-bullying curriculum within it? So. Before we even went into looking at second step or positive action, we had a committee from we had members from each school be part of a committee to look at what does Castle have to offer that is research based, evidence based, and had to have an anti bullying curriculum. Those were our asks, um, and so when we looked across all of the Castle aligned curriculum that was out there that offered evidence, research, and anti bullying curriculum, the two that the committee came up with was positive action and second step. So second step has 20 lessons total mm -hmm. in K through, well, in the K through five, which is what we're looking, they do K through eight. They have 20 lessons total, but they have five, which are anti-bullying lessons in addition to that. They have a- Particularly up at the high school, um, in my work with Principal Damaris and Dr. Jessica Stevens, the associate principal back in August, September, um, some of their initial requests were really helping us to break down the barriers of transportation. Um, and so we put out a survey, uh, really, that is a multi-step survey, you know, that leads you down a different questioning pathway, depending upon how you answered the questions before, mm -hmm. so that we can really get some hard data as it relates to exactly your point, where I live, um, and what are my impacts and barriers to get to school, Yes. Um, versus some ways with which I could get to school, but I choose not to, I go a different way. Okay. Um, so we are looking at this from a multifaceted approach. Uh, we are also taking a hard look right now um, at the neighborhood school model. Uh, we are looking at a few different shifts that I'm not privy to speak of right now in this meeting, but there is some forward planning to really help us get back to the neighborhood school model with which we subscribe to, but doesn't always necessarily play itself out that way because of other competing priorities that end up happening. Sure. Um, and then what that what that does over years and years of that compounded, well, I'm going to move you for this reason this year, but now all of a sudden you are historically forever out of your neighborhood school, right? Um, I think it's important as a district and as a community that we come back to really supporting and, and, and understanding the roots of cause of like where a lot of some of these things came from with having kids being placed in certain schools and the challenges that has come with years of competing priorities around class size, prioritizing schools, prioritizing special populations, prioritizing special programs for special populations. And keeping in mind, if we look over a 10 year window, our number of English language learners has risen, our number of special education, yeah. substantially separate students has risen, all of which require specific programming that has not always been universally distributed across our community. So when those decisions had to be made, other groups of students got defaulted into other schools. So as a result of all of those pieces, 
We are doing some very, very deep work right now and building some discussion types around 2501 and how that building will leverage some of this discussion. Um, but then also where are our most high um, enrollment numbers across the district and how do we support getting kids back into their neighborhood school so that transportation is not the main variable. Sure. Um, my location to my school from where I live right out the gate isn't the number one variable to my inability to get to school. Um, so we are looking at this through a multi-lens avenue right now, um, just not at a place that we can report out on anything actionable. And I don't want anyone in the community thinking we're like, moving. you know, completely yeah, moving everybody moving around. Forward. That is not what we're saying. No. But just no. really trying to think critically around how we can set our kids and families up to be more successful um, and really lean true to this neighborhood school model that we describe and, and market as the way we do business here in Florida. But also acknowledging the fact that in the last 20, 25 years or so, we went from 28 schools yes. to 16 mm -hmm. schools. Big and that change. is a huge shift, yeah. which has so much impact. Right. Just for the public certification, when I was a child, I grew up in the Flint. There was the Coughlin, there was the Watson, there was Duvall, there was Aldridge, and there was Davis. There were five schools in the neighborhood I grew up in, and every student in all of those schools could walk to school with no issues whatsoever. And in the 90s, when the new schools got built, everything changed. That's just what we have to deal with in our community. But what I'm more concerned about is how DESE penalizes school districts over attendance related issues. And I don't believe, I'm glad to hear that Desi's revisiting those goals right now. That's news to me as of today. That's good news. Uh, I'm, I've sat here for an hour listening to you guys do all this great programming that you're doing on behalf of parents and students and of course our staff. In the, in the schools. And you guys are working relentlessly to try to improve the situation at the grassroots level. So with all of that great work going on and attendance is still such a thorny issue, I can't help but put the onus on the parents. And I know that there are cultural issues involved in this. And I know that you guys are working relentlessly to try to figure all of that out and, and I think you're getting there because I'm very pleased with, with the report out in this meeting right now. There's a lot of good work being done and as long as Desi isn't penalizing us in any way because we're working our tails off to get every kid into school every day. That's my biggest concern and also I'm making a plea to the parents, please parents, please. My parents made sure when I was a child that I would be in school every day. And it served me well throughout life. And so as a parent, I made sure my children went to school every day when they weren't sick. Please parents, get your kids to school every day when they're not sick. That's my biggest plea. Thanks, I yield. And just to add to that, if you're struggling with your kid's school, please reach out so we can help fix whatever that barrier might be with your child's school, if for whatever reason you're not sending them. If there's anything we can do to help families get their kids in school, we're here for them too. Um, you know, And just be prepared, we do come knocking if, if they're not coming, because we need to make sure that our kids are safe, um, that we have eyes on our kids, um, and that school is a priority, and we'll do whatever we can to help make it a priority. But I think that's an important component, is that we're validating that there are barriers. And yep. you know, I started school 30, seven years ago, right? Shut up, Bobby. <laughs> I started just calling the old. I started school 37 years ago, and the needs 37 years ago of families looks very different than the needs that they are now. So I think it's a combination of validating that things are very different right now, and um, when families are having challenges, that the school is a safe place to be able to say, I need support, and it's not punitive. Because I think sometimes families... Um, automatic, when you say, like, oh, we come knocking, right, what does that mean? And immediately that evokes a lot of fear and concern for families, right? So when we say, like, the onus is on families, it is, right? Like, of course, because we can't get children out of bed in the morning. But at the same time, there has to be a homeschool community 
ownership of that work and so how do we make that happen and I think the school piece is happening I think the community piece is starting to happen but then if we we look at the the value and support for families to get their kids in and I think transportation is a big one child care is another big one those are huge issues having clean clothes is a big one and I think the more that families know that schools are willing to support them in that versus it being a punitive piece it feels more accessible it's my social worker hat I'll take it off anything else on attendance So last item is 3.5, CPAC, LPAC engagement. Um, it looks like you've got a lot of great things happening, especially in your LPAC. Yeah, so we're excited. Our LPAC is in its very, right now, developing stages. Um, LPAC? Our English learner LPAC, uh, parent, parent, Academy, advisory. parent Advisory Council, um, which is mandated through DESE. Similarly, there is a Special Education Parent Advisory Council, which is also a, uh, mandated by DESE. Um, our special education parent advisory council is has more history um, and more of a long-standing place within the district. Um, I know that the CPAC has regularly scheduled meetings um, in December. Balanced learning presented to families about sibling relationships, as well as the DocuSign process, which is a very big one across our special education world. As we know, this fall, um, the school committee supported the use of DocuSign, which is. Uh, really in place to help expedite the signing of official documents through special education. Um, so I know getting families trained on that, knowing what to expect from the recipient angle of that um, is some of the work that has been done across the CPAC. There is a meeting tonight um, going over organization tips for families of disabled children, and I think that's at cost mm -hmm. at 6. Yep, yeah. so it's at cost. Hence, the January meeting is planned for tonight. Didn't realize that. Had Otherwise, I would have put that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, but they ha they do have their regularly scheduled meetings. Um, and Megan Murphy is the president of the CPAC, CPAC um, and, and certainly works in tight partnership with uh, Lori Obenchain, our assistant superintendent for special ed. Um, similarly, on the English learner side, in the in historically, we did have an LPAC. Um, and then with some change in leadership and COVID, the LPAC kind of fell apart a little bit. Yeah. So now we are re-bringing it up. Um, right now we are in the process of soliciting coffee hours across the district. Uh, that's the little chart that you can see. Uh, we're all over the district between evening hours, morning hours at pace. Um, and excitedly, we have had families at every single coffee hour. So we are excited that there has been families coming to join us. Uh, whether it was a small group or a larger group, we've been really able to hear some really good information as it relates to the, the stories that our families have experienced through their interactions with the four of the public schools and through their experiences within the four of the public schools and Fall River community at large, which has been nice to also, you know, be the, the sounding board for. So we will continue those coffee hours through the course of this week. Um, and in addition to that, we are in the process of also building out um, the ESL Leadership Academy or Leadership Group, which would be essentially like the, the, the governing board of the LPAC as it becomes to take some form of identification. Um, our community facilitators have been really instrumental in helping us to recruit for the coffee hours, um, get folks to, to be there, serve as translators at the coffee hours so that everything was done with a person who could speak the native tongue. We didn't want to be relying on Lionbridge or any of those other um, tools, um, really trying to personalize the experience for families. So we are excited um, that our LPAC will be launching uh, by the beginning of February as a result of the coffee hours and the information gathered at the coffee hours. So that too will be up and running and that was a real community partnership between the MLL director, which is Lisa Zagarella, um, who has been so unwaveringly committed to see this off the ground, um, partnered with the community facilitators in PACE, um, and together we were really able in a quick amount of time, turn it over, key turn it, and we even were getting participants at the same time, which was even better. Um, so we are excited to see an uptick of just parent participation across the range of areas that we're exposing, and we're only four months, you know, five months into the work, realistically. So um, again, we're excited to be building some predictable groups for families to be a part of, um, and predictable opportunities on a monthly basis for families to come together, and we will continue to build upon that 
as we continue to build a scope and sequence for the work um, so that we are meeting the needs of our kids and families across all of our parent networks that do exist, whether it's formal or informal. I hope that all the good work that, that's going on and being developed it translates into better attendance down the road too. I hope there's a, a, dir too. a direct connection. <laughs> Us too. All of that, Us you know? too. We're going to get yeah. there. We are going to get there. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I've got lots of confidence in our kids and families, lots of confidence in our building-based teams to create these communities that kids just can't imagine themselves anywhere but the Florida Public Schools. And when we can get to that place, Hopefully, we're going to be hitting the target at that point. And until then, we're just going to keep on striving. Mm -hmm. um, except by, that one snow day. Except that one snow day, exactly. <laughs> I'll work on that, okay? Every time there's a <laughs> snow <laughs> in the forecast, I'm texting Maria. Don't even talk about it. Yeah. Just one. Why are kids dying for snow day? No, I am. I, I am a street. I think a lot of people are. Right, it's on Sunday. It's snow day. So, I have to Super Bowl. Is there <laughs> any? <laughs> the damn Super Bowl. Well, there you go. Is there Let's any other, <laughs> um, any new business? Okay, then we'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Then we are adjourned. Awesome.